Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Hello and welcome to another episode of People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Dominic Shikitano, and I'm a research associate here at the Environmental Law Institute, or ELI. ELI has partnered with Sidley and Austin LLP to launch a new podcast series called The Enforcement Angle. This year-long series will feature conversations about state and federal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations with senior enforcement officials and thought leaders on environmental enforcement in the United States and globally. The host of this series is Justin Savage. Justin is a partner and the global co-leader of the environmental practice at Sidley and Austin LLP. From 2004 to 2013, Justin served as senior counsel and a trial attorney for the Environmental Enforcement Section of the U.S. Department of Justice's Environment and Natural Resources Division. On today's episode, Justin speaks with Catherine McCabe, the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, referred to in shorthand as DEP. Since its founding 50 years ago, DEP has been a national and global leader on a wide range of environmental issues, from remediation to environmental justice. Thanks for coming on today, Justin, to record another episode of The Enforcement Angle. Um, We're really excited to have you and Catherine with us today. Thanks, Dominic. How are you doing today, Catherine? We're doing great, Justin. I hope you're doing well, too. I am particularly heartened this week that we will have a new president uh, who believes in science and environmental protection. Uh, And I am looking forward to his using his well-earned reputation as a uniter to uh, change the the tone of things throughout the country and and bring us all together to work on the really challenging environmental and other problems that we have. It's been an exciting week and hopefully we'll have a little less drama as we get into the new year. Before we talk shop, uh, I'd like the audience just to get a sense of you, uh, where you grew up, family, pets, sports teams, anything else you want to share just so that folks get a sense of, of who you are? All righty. Well, where I grew up is upstate New York and Albany to be specific, but I also spent my summers in the Adirondack Mountains, which is the original source of my love for our natural environment. I came from a large Irish clan with seven siblings and 30 first cousins. And as the big sister of my immediate family, the importance and habit of hard work and family values and taking care of others was impressed upon me from an early age. And I married a guy from a similar background. He even has one more sibling than I do. And we have three wonderful adult children who we loved raising and who are now dedicating their careers to various types of public service. And most recently, as as I mentioned earlier, Justin, um, we have two little granddaughters who are bringing us tremendous joy. And I'm loving being a grandmother even more uh, than being a mother. Yeah, that, that's terrific. I come from a large Irish family as well. I had eight aunts and uncles, and I don't know if you've gone on Ancestry, but uh, tracing it back to the mother country has been quite interesting in terms of family stories and lore of where we came from. And then it turns out the DNA uh, confirmed we're, we're all from Cork. So it's a, it's a great history. Well, that would make us neighbors. I believe we, uh, one branch of my family, my mother's uh, side was from uh, not Cork, but Limerick, which isn't all that far away. And I believe we have people that go back and carry. And then on the, on the McCabe side, actually my coming down through my father's line, we're more Northern Irish. Um, probably came over from Scotland centuries ago to Ireland. Oh, wow. Wow. That's that's quite a history and it's a great place and hopefully things will get better so we can uh, go visit the mother country uh, soon. But I I wanted to turn a little bit to your career path. Just we met more than 15 years ago. I I worked for you. You were the ultimate boss on the coal-fired power plant initiative at the U.S. Justice Department. And then Since then, it's been great to see you in the news, leading other organizations, but for maybe for folks who aren't as familiar with your career, just walk us through your professional path leading to your current uh, job as the commissioner of DEP. Well, that's quite a a long and windy road at this point, Justin. Um, 
educationally, I had a background undergrad and graduate in environmental science and then went to law school uh, in New York. And I, I started out my legal career in a Manhattan law firm, learning the basics of many areas of the law. And uh, I think most importantly for a law firm, the importance of doing thorough and high quality work. Uh, but I did follow my love for the environment and then went to the New York Attorney General's office where I worked in the Environmental Protection Bureau. And that was at a time when environmental laws were just being developed, particularly in the hazardous waste field. It was in post Love Canal days or really Love Canal days when the litigation was just beginning, which New York as well as the Justice Department was involved in. And um, it was really thrilling uh, to be able to make new law. I was actually um, had the privilege and success of getting the first judicial ruling in the country that invoked common law principles to establish joint and several liability for hazardous waste contamination. And we were able to use that decision as our uh, sole United States precedent when we wrote the Chemdime brief at Justice that established uh, the joint and several liability principle under Superfund. So it was really thrilling to be able to move from the state to the uh, Justice Department uh, Environment Division, it was called Lands Division at that time. And the environmental enforcement section became my home for 20 years, as you know. Uh, in the early days, there was big Superfund litigation, making new federal law, but I also spent many years litigating not only Superfund cases, but cases under all the federal environmental statutes including, as you pointed out, the Clean Air Act NSR litigation to get the coal-fired power plants uh, throughout the country or in the eastern part of the country, at least, to put on pollution controls, or better yet, as many of them ultimately chose to do, uh, convert to natural gas, which has had a uh, major benefit for public health throughout the eastern United States. Um, it, as you know, Justin, it was really a privilege to work in the enforcement section. There were so many talented and hardworking and dedicated people there. And I was also lucky enough during my time at uh, ENRD, as we call it now, to be able to spend some years doing other types of work uh, in then litigation in congressional liaison and legislation. I worked uh, basically on the Hill for two years uh, as part of what was then called the policy legislation and special litigation section. I think it's called policy and law now. And then I moved over also to be the assistant chief in the natural resource section that defended uh, takings cases against the federal government. So I thank ENRD for a very diverse and rich uh, litigation training and experience. Uh, DOJ also gave me my first management opportunities as an assistant chief in the enforcement section and the natural resources section, and then as a uh, deputy chief of the environmental enforcement section, which was probably the seat that I was sitting in at the time that we met. I want to um, also mention that I was lucky enough while I was at DOJ to have had the flexibility of working part time while raising children, thanks to your partner, David Buente and uh, John Cruden, who uh, said that David Buente had grandfathered me. Well, that's more like grandmothering in my uh, language, uh, but he allowed me to continue uh, doing that part-time work uh, for a number of years. Uh, so many people, frankly, myself included, wonder if this could be done successfully, combining litigation and management responsibilities while working a part-time schedule. And I'm really proud that I and others like me, other women who uh, did that, it was mostly women, proved that it can be done and very successfully. And I won't say it's without stress. Uh, John Cruden did used to brag that he got more work out of me on my part-time schedule than uh, from many others who were working full-time. When I left DOJ, I went over to EPA as the principal deputy assistant administrator of EPA's Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance, which we all fondly know of as OECA. I was there for six years, uh, and then I became a judge on EPA's Environmental Appeals Board. Uh, in 2014, I went back home to New York, New York City um, to be specific, and became the Deputy Regional Administrator of EPA's Region 2 office which really was a fabulous experience, letting me get my boots back on the ground in New York and New Jersey and Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, it was a real boots on the ground experience when hurricanes Maria and Irma blew into the Virgin Islands and, and Puerto Rico in 2017. Uh, and I was actually down there literally with um, boots on the ground uh, working in that emergency response experience. 
I'd had experience before in, in working on the BP oil spill, um, as well as Hurricane Katrina, but being DC based, that was much more uh, support work um, and not so much boots on the ground. So the, the boots on the ground opportunity in region two was really great. And as you probably know, when the Trump administration came in, in 2017, I spent a month as the acting administrator while Scott Pruitt's nomination was under consideration by the Senate. And then for most of the rest of that year, I was the acting regional administrator for region two. I was really thrilled to get the call from Phil Murphy when he was elected as governor of New Jersey at the end of 2017 and became commissioner of the DEP in New Jersey when he took office at the beginning of 2018. And talk about boots on the ground. Uh, being the commissioner of the legendary New Jersey DEP uh, is an incredible honor and opportunity. It really has been a terrific experience to work on a lot of exciting and challenging issues with a great team working to make a real difference on fighting climate change, helping to bring offshore wind to New Jersey, environmental justice, hot water contamination issues like lead and drinking water and PFAS, and so many more things. Um, it really has been a, a terrific experience. And, and that's just a remarkable journey done with incredible word economy and pathos and you know just for working moms that are out there and I can certainly relate to some degree because my wife Amy continued to work as we had kids you know what what can advice can you give them just to you know keep going and how do we as a society encourage that um, because you listen to your career path and you know what if you had stepped aside at some point so how would you encourage Catherine other working moms who are coming up today to to keep going and institutions to support them well, institutions obviously need to be flexible and, and the um, women and men who want to uh, spend time um, with their children while they're raising them uh, and also handle their challenging work responsibilities are actually living in a lucky day right now. Uh, this pandemic has brought us an awful lot of um, heartache and loss, but it has also uh, woken the world up to realize that we live in the age where virtual communication can be seamless and you can really work um, very well and very flexibly from home as well as from the office and use that to juggle uh, the many things that you need to juggle in, in the 24 hours that we have every day uh, with your family uh, being able to back each other up. I know it's gotten more difficult for people with uh, the challenges of, of having caretakers come into the home or taking children out to daycare. Uh, my daughter is, is facing those challenges today as I watch her and her husband uh, trying to make those very difficult choices. But to all of them, I say, don't give up. Do not be shy to ask. Never assume that you can't do it. You can do it. We need to be patient with ourselves. We need to be flexible and above all, really stay dedicated to our mission. There is a path forward. Yeah, that, that, that is so important. And, and turning to your, your current position, you've touched on this a little bit, but you're, you're the head of a large, well-known organization enjoying its 50 year, 50th year in existence. And really, what do you see as your min, mission as the leader, as the commissioner of DEP? Well, um, at the outset of the Murphy administration, I uh, picked up on the governor's priorities, but also on mine, uh, to establish five priorities for the DEP during my tenure. Uh, the first one, you won't be surprised, is fighting climate change. Uh, and that is, of course, both on what we call the mitigation side by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and also on the uh, resilience and adaptation planning side. We know very well in New Jersey that climate change is already here and we need to get quickly about the business of building up our resilience and adapting to it. The second priority is protecting our precious water. New Jersey relies both on surface water and on our groundwater uh, for our drinking water supplies. And as you may know, New Jersey has a history of um, fairly extensive industrial contamination that has affected our groundwater as well as our surface water. So it's really important to protect um, the uh, drinking water sources that we have now. We also have uh, 
problems with drinking water systems and old problems like lead contamination, as well as new problems like PFAS and other emerging contaminants that we are unfortunately finding in our groundwater and surface waters and, and sometimes in our drinking water supplies. Also important for protecting our water is uh, reducing the combined sewer overflow discharges from our sewers. New Jersey was somewhat late to the game on that, I think uh, some years back uh, with a little pressure from EPA, uh, New Jersey began the process of bringing the CSOs to a permitting regime where they all have long-term control plans now to get those CSOs under control, which makes a very big difference uh, to protecting the quality of, of our drinking water and our surface waters. Our third priority we call protecting public health and revitalizing our communities, and that includes uh, environmental justice, it includes revitalizing brownfields in our communities. We've got a lot of those. And cleaning up New Jersey's many hazardous waste sites. Uh, they, many of them have been cleaned up. New Jersey, I think, was one of the first, was probably the first state to step up uh, to put sites on the Superfund list to get going early on cleaning up our hazardous waste sites. And that earned us the honor, which I think continues to this day, of having the most Superfund sites on the NPL of any state in the country. Our fourth priority is protecting New Jersey's amazing natural resources. I don't know if you're aware of this, Justin, but in addition to its environmental regulation and enforcement work, New Jersey DEP also has responsibility for protecting New Jersey's lands and our forests, fish and wildlife, marine fisheries, and endangered species. So we're kind of like EPA and DOI and NOAA uh, as well as the forestry part of the D Federal Department of Ag uh, wrapped into one. We are also responsible for land use permitting in sensitive environmental areas like the coast and riparian areas along streams and endangered species habitats. For the most densely populated state in the country, New Jersey has an amazing number and variety of parks and wildlife management areas but we have to stay very, very much on our toes to keep them protected and preserved, uh, not only for the benefit of the current generations, but for future generations. And uh, another um, silvery lining in the pandemic has been that the public's appreciation and use of those resources has risen dramatically uh, during the pandemic as we all struggle with uh, the difficulties of confinement everyone wants to come out to the parks and to the wildlife management areas so it's it's been terrific to see that appreciation and, and use of our outdoor resources although it has been a real challenge for us here in new jersey to manage the crowds in a way that keeps everyone safe and then lastly uh, the fifth priority but one that uh, really underlies all of the others is strengthening the DEP. As you know, Justin, environmental protection is not easy work. Whether you're doing regulation or enforcement or permitting, virtually all of the issues that we deal with are hard, uh, scientifically and technically, and also have many opinions with very strong views on many sides of any given issue. And it is so important uh, to support the people who are doing that environmental protection work for the public to instill a sense of responsibility and pride in public service in them, to help keep up their morale and their dedication for doing that critical work in times of stress, and to do our best to get them the resources they need. Uh, frankly, that is always a challenge, whether you're working at the federal or the state level, because all of our environmental agencies, as I think those who, who uh, work with them or have worked in them know, are really underfunded for the breadth of the mission that they are asked to accomplish. So I've made strengthening the DEP and morale at the DEP a major focus and a key principle of the way that I manage the DEP. I also asked all the people of the DEP to follow five basic principles. Uh, I ask everyone to memorize this and to stick to them whenever they need to make a decision. They are really simple. Principle number one is follow the law. Principle number two, use the best available science. Principle number three is listen to all sides, even when you don't agree with them. And four, when making a decision, strike the right balance. 
And five, critically important, is to always be honest and transparent with the public. Those are very simple principles, uh, and we have no trouble whatsoever following them at the New Jersey DEP. I wish I could say that the federal government is currently following all of those principles at the highest level. I have been very disappointed um, that the leadership um, at the federal level over the past four years has really thrown many of these aside, but I know that the career folks uh, who are still working in environmental protection and so many other public service jobs in the uh, federal departments follow these principles every day in the work that they do. Yeah, that that that's a great overview of just how difficult these issues are and then the different policy clashes that have occurred. And you really touched on this at the beginning, Catherine, with the Biden administration coming in and, and um, that's going to happen. I, I know there's a lot of quote unquote theater around uh, the challenges, but let's be real, that's going to happen. How do you see your relationship or in the in DEP's relationship with EPA changing uh, once uh, the new term begins with the Biden administration? Well, we've been very lucky in New Jersey uh, in maintaining the really good relationship with the EPA regional office, um, region two here, as well as with many of the um, career people in EPA headquarters. Um, we've had disagreements with the EPA leadership in the Trump administration over a variety of issues. And I am looking forward to the Biden administration where I expect to see much more alignment uh, on policy issues, but also much more cooperative working relationships with the states. Um, as a member of ECOS, the Environmental Council of the States, uh, where New Jersey is only one of 50, but we've all been somewhat um, distressed, uh, regardless of whether you're in a red or blue state, uh, with the lack of cooperation and, and transparency uh, that we have seen coming from the leadership of the Trump administration, which makes all of our work together much more difficult to accomplish. So I'm very, very much looking forward to the new uh, leadership in the Biden administration. And, and can you just comment on an, an overarching issue in our field? I mean, it's within our lifetimes, really, that environmental enforcement and protection has become so partisan. Uh, it used to be much more of a nonpartisan issue. If you think back to the first Bush administration, which really led the charge to the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, do you just have any thoughts, not as a DEP commissioner, but just as a citizen, why some of these issues have become so partisan? Because, I don't know, I mean, I'm almost 50. It seems like in my lifetime, it gets more and more partisan as the years go by. But any thoughts on that? Yes, and I have many more years uh, of, of learning on, on that same uh, issue, Justin, because I go actually in the federal government all the way back to the Reagan administration. Now, you wouldn't have thought that the Reagan administration would naturally be the strongest one for environmental protection. Uh, but when I look back on this the, through the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration uh, and even into the Clinton administration, as you said, there, there was um, really a, a lot of bipartisan cooperation, and particularly on the Hill, particularly in Congress, where we were still in the phase of making new laws, new environmental statutes. When new statutes are drafted, typically it turns out in implementation that you find that there are some things that maybe uh, weren't done quite right, which leads to litigation. Um, and unnecessary litigation in, in many, uh, on many issues. So it was rather easy uh, with the ongoing dialogue between both uh, the parties on Capitol Hill to have a conversation with them about what we used to call technical fixes to the environmental statutes. Um, so we could at least agree on things that were just technical, even if people continue to disagree on major policy issues. I first saw that start falling away, uh, frankly, when Newt Gingrich uh, became the Speaker of the House. I was doing congressional work at that time, so I spent um, most of my time, frankly, up on the Hill, uh, so I saw all of this up close and personal. And the tone changed. Uh, it changed dramatically. All of a sudden, people um, were throwing aside conventions of ordinary courtesy. Uh, and listening well to each other, and there was a lot more contention 
Um, so I date it from that day. And I think there wasn't as much of that during the Bush administration, which um, you know I, I served in at both DOJ and at EPA. Uh, there was still a stronger uh, policy disagreement on issues, I think, but the the tone of courtesy, at least, was was still well maintained. I think so much depends on the leaders, and um, Newt Gingrich did not bring a tone of, co of bipartisan cooperation um, or any kind of cooperation um, really to the proceedings on the Hill. And uh, of course, during the Obama administration, uh, it, it kind of flipped the other way uh, when the Republicans took back control of both houses of Congress. It was startling to see uh, the tone change again there um, and, and get even worse in terms of bipartisan work being harder to do and the tone of courtesy and cooperation um, becoming more frayed. There were many people who, for reasons that I will never understand, um, really uh, disliked President Obama and, and the Obama administration that went well beyond policy. Uh, and that tone continued to deteriorate. And I, I think that we saw in the 2016 election and what has happened since then, that the leadership matters so much and the tone that is taken by the leaders matters so much and so much more than the policies. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm so heartened to see Joe Biden coming in as our president because I think he's someone who has a long history of working um, across party lines and as a uniter and looking for uh, places where we can agree. And most importantly, of keeping that tone of courtesy and and goodwill that enables us to overcome our policy and other differences to find common ground. Yeah, that, that was very well said. And if you travel internationally, and I sure you have, we have such a great environment here in terms of clean air, clean water, soil. There's always things we can do to improve it. But it's actually been a remarkable accomplishment thanks to people such as you over the decades. And hopefully people can come to recognize that you can have that and have a strong economy. And we can frankly get rid of some of the silliness. But editorial over, uh, switching back to just your mission right now. You know, what are you, you've touched on some of this, but what do you see as some of the priorities from an enforcement perspective at DEP? DEP's highest priority uh, during the Murphy administration is protecting public health. And we've had a particular focus on environmental justice areas because that's where the need uh, is typically greatest. We've taken many actions to control air pollution sources in EJ neighborhoods and developed very uh, active relationships with EJ advocacy groups in those areas to make sure that we know where their biggest concerns lie. Protecting drinking water has also been a very high priority for our enforcement program. We've taken action to address lead contamination in two of the state's biggest cities, uh, Newark and Trenton, and filed a number of judicial actions to hold accountable the companies that have extensively polluted our groundwater with PFAS and other contamination. We also have a lot of landfills in New Jersey that continue to cause us problems, whether they're large legacy landfills that are closed, but continuing to emit methane and odors, or smaller local operations that are not operating properly and are causing odor or water contamination problems. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a responsibility for land use regulation in many areas of New Jersey, and we take really seriously violations of our land use regulations uh, because it's critically important um, in such a densely populated state to make sure that we preserve the lands that we have. So uh, we've taken uh, a newly uh, more aggressive uh, enforcement approach where we see people doing things like bulldozing dunes along beaches. You would not believe that that could happen in this day and age, but yet it still does happen. And true to our reputation and history, we still have a lot of hazardous waste sites here, large and small around the state that need to be remediated. And we don't hesitate to take enforcement action there when the responsible parties are not stepping up to do the right thing. I'm glad to say that they typically do. Uh, but where they do not, we do not hesitate to take enforcement action. 
And of course, we also expect responsible parties to take responsibility and pay for natural resource damage where hazardous waste disposal or, or other pollution has damaged the precious natural resources of our state. And most especially, we find that uh, has happened uh, in too many places to our groundwater and wetlands. So we have filed, um, I think now over 40 with two new actions that were filed uh, on November 10th or 11th, can't remember the exact date. Uh, we have filed many natural resource damage actions in part to make up for the complete inactivity on that front in the last administration in New Jersey. The Christie administration uh, put an end to bringing natural resource damage cases, but the natural resource damage remained. It's still out there. It still needs restoration. It still needs attention. Um, and so we've, we've already moved forward aggressively on that front. And that, that's a great overview. Is there any other thoughts you have just on how DEP approaches natural resource damage targeting and enforcement? Well, we look for those situations where there's been a significant damage to a natural resource, such as damage to a groundwater aquifer that is important to us as a current or future drinking water source. Um, and we look where we have the greatest opportunity to make a difference. Uh, by bringing the action, whether um, through restoring that natural resource or when that's not possible, as unfortunately happens, uh, getting restoration or replacement work or acquisition uh, elsewhere for an equivalent resource that can begin to make the public whole. And we place a premium, as always, in looking for uh, those opportunities to benefit environmental justice communities as you're probably aware, Justin, people in those communities have so little benefit of, of natural resources. And so many of the natural resources in those areas have become contaminated. So we uh, look especially for opportunities to improve that situation for our people. That's helpful in terms of understanding DEP's approach. And just to follow up on one other issue, DEP since its founding 50 years ago has really been a leader in remediation and you mentioned PFAS or per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And can you share any other thoughts just on DEPs addressing PFAS, including potential actions that your agency might be considering in the future? Well, we've already taken both regulatory and enforcement action to address the most ubiquitous PFAS chemicals that we found in New Jersey drinking water supplies and, and, and groundwater. Uh, we set the first uh, PFAS MCLs under the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act of New Jersey um, in the country for PFNA, PFOA, and PFOS, PFOS. Uh, and those are, are the ones, the PFOA and the PFAS that you hear about most often. PFOA was the subject of that film with Mark Rufo called uh, Dark Waters. Uh, we have, like many other states, have found uh, PFOA and PFAS in, in many places, but the uh, work that it takes to address that both uh, on a regulatory and, and uh, basis and on an enforcement basis is quite a heavy lift. It does require an extensive amount of scientific research and detailed rule writing, um, not to mention litigation to defend the rule, in order to set standards um, for these compounds that make it possible to bring uh, effective enforcement actions. New Jersey is particularly lucky to have some really terrific scientific expertise, uh, both in-house and from the outside experts of our Drinking Water Quality Institute, as well as at our Department of Health. Uh, and that enabled us to be the first state in the nation to start adopting those MCL standards. Uh, other states have followed our lead on that. Uh, but as you know, there are many other types of PFAS out there uh, because the industry invents replacements as quickly as we catch on to the problems with the existing chemicals. Um, we saw that in Cape Fear, North Carolina when uh, the Gen X contamination uh, emerged, uh, Gen X being a replacement, I believe, for PFOA. Uh, and we've seen that in New Jersey as well. Gen we've got Gen X here as well. Uh, and in a lawsuit that we filed on, one of the two that we filed on November 10th had to do with PFAS contamination at a site along the Delaware River owned currently by uh, Salve. 
uh, where they have not only the past contamination with PFNA, but they're continuing to use an, another replacement chemical that we need to know and understand a lot more about. So it would really be best, frankly, if all of these chemicals could be regulated as a class and if EPA would set the standards on a nationwide basis. Now, responsible science-based standards, of course. Uh, we tried taking a look here at New Jersey as to whether we could uh, devise a way of regulating these substances as a class because there are so many of them, but there's two major obstacles to that effort. First, the scientists tell us that the different types of PFAS are so different that one standard will never fit them all. You really have to analyze them all individually, which is a huge amount of work. And the second major obstacle has been that EPA has not been leading in this effort, but has in recent years at least been taking a backseat. Both states are really not up, um, set up to handle this type of scientific and technical challenge. That's really what EPA should be doing. Um, I know that the EPA technical folks are continuing to do scientific work on that and that other agencies, ATSDR uh, at the CDC is, as well, are working on that. And, and we hope that in the Biden administration um, that we will begin to see uh, more of an effort there because this is uh, a contamination problem that is a serious threat to our drinking water supplies all around the country, or at least in many places around the country. Uh, and New Jersey is proud to lead and to start the way, but we cannot do this alone. Thanks. And, and following up on another issue you mentioned, environmental justice, New Jersey recently enacted landmark environmental justice legislation, S-232. From your vantage point as commissioner, what are the key takeaways from this legislation for folks who are not as familiar with it? Well, thanks for that question, Justin, because this is really an amazing new development for environmental justice. The EJ advocates here in New Jersey are calling it the holy grail. It's a first for the country, I believe. Um, the new law authorizes the DEP to take environmental justice into consideration when it's issuing a permit under the environmental statutes of New Jersey. Uh, which, as you know, are patterned on and we implement many of the federal statutes. It applies to several types of noxious facilities that typically are located in EJ communities. And that includes incinerators and other major air pollution sources, Title V sources, as we typically refer to them, uh, scrap metal facilities, solid waste transfer stations and large recycling facilities which unfortunately are too often located in our most vulnerable communities and sewage treatment plants and sludge processing facilities as well as landfills so whenever someone applies for a permit to build or to expand one of these types of facilities in an ej neighborhood or even seeks to renew an existing permit they will have to prepare an environmental justice impact statement. We call that an EJIS that identifies both the existing sources of pollution and other public health stressors in that community and the impact that the facility itself will have if the permit is granted. So we're hoping that this EJIS itself, just like an EIS, will serve the purpose of raising everyone's awareness, including the applicants, of the public health implications of facility siting, because that has too often been ignored at the local level and the state and federal government do not have the laws to be able to reach down to that local level to address it effectively. So what will happen if the EJIS is done and it shows that there would be cumulative adverse public health impacts from the new facility in a particular neighborhood uh, that is disproportionately high compared to most average neighborhoods, the DEP is actually required by our law to deny the permit for a new facility. We can't deny the permit for an expanded facility or to renew the permit for an existing facility, but we can add conditions to that permit uh, to protect public health in that circumstance. So in effect, the cumulative public health impact, which is assessed on a very localized basis, becomes an overlay on the usual regulatory standards that we enforce 
uh, say for air pollution, like the Clean Air Act technology-based emission limits or NAAQS standards. Um, as good a job as those standards do in reducing pollution and protecting public health over broad areas across the country and across our state, we all know that they don't effectively reach the very localized effects on communities that have a concentration of these facilities. So this will very much be a new day for environmental justice in New Jersey and lead to a fairer um, and better uh, day for our environmental justice communities. And we hope that other states will follow and emulate our example. Another high profile issue on which New Jersey has been out in front has been climate change. And certainly in my lifetime, this presidential election has featured climate change more than any other and what role do you see climate change in terms of affecting DEP's enforcement priorities and mission? Well, I see that it will have a huge role in the future. We are currently preparing to issue regulations to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, and we have the power to do that under our state law, and enforcement of those regulations will be very high on our list. Uh, methane emissions from landfills are also on our enforcement uh, targeting screen. And we're phasing out HFCs here in New Jersey, and we will be serious about enforcing that requirement. We've also been cracking down and will continue to crack down on mobile source emission violations, like what we found to be unfortunately common practices or too common of disconnecting vehicle emission controls, uh, which people do to get better mileage, uh, and truck idling in EJ neighborhoods, particularly around ports. Enforcement is always important to reduce the load of the uh, particulates and other criteria pollutants that affect public health, like NOx. But we also typically will get GHG emission reduction benefits as well when we use the Clean Air Act to crack down on criteria pollutants. So that, that is and will remain very high on our enforcement priorities. On the adaptation side, which is so critical for climate change that's already happening and that we know will come regardless of, of how effective we are in reducing our emissions around the globe, we already are taking a stepped up approach to dealing with violations of land use regulations in climate vulnerable areas, as I mentioned earlier. And we're working on tightening up our land use restrictions in areas that are going to become uh, more vulnerable, vulnerable to flooding and permanent inundation. And we will be placing a, a strong emphasis on enforcement of those regulations once they're enacted to ensure that they're actually followed. And another area that you know is already a high focus for us, drinking water will continue to become even more important to protect through both regulation and enforcement as climate change droughts start to bring us water supply limitations. And yes, this happens even in New Jersey, which everyone thinks of as a fairly wet state, but climate change is not an equal opportunity actor. And we do have parts of our state that face that uh, problem from climate change as well. Thanks, Catherine. And just reflecting on our conversation this morning, uh, you certainly have an expansive portfolio and just a remarkable career in public service, both at a federal and state level. I think, unfortunately, polls indicate that younger folks continue to have declining interest in serving. How would you encourage those looking to serve at DEP, EPA, or other environmental agencies so that we have that next generation of public servants? Well, Justin, uh, in the end, you can only really inform others by your own experience and example. Uh, I've had an amazingly interesting and satisfying career by working in public service. And knowing, um, despite the many challenges, which I won't deny, that my work actually makes a difference um, every day and makes the world a better place for us all. And there really is no better career satisfaction than that. It's not lost on me that my three children, all of whom are very bright and capable people who would have been successful in any career path they chose, have all chosen public service careers for themselves. And I like to think that seeing how happy and satisfied I've been in my work was an important factor for them in making that choice. And now I see all of them really enjoying their work and their careers and their lives. So especially with the challenges of climate change that are upon us, I think working in public service for environmental protection 
is a recipe not only for making a difference to the world, but for your own personal satisfying career and happy life. And that really should be the best encouragement of all for anyone who's trying to make a choice that will bring them satisfaction for the rest of our lives. Uh, Justin, I would also point out, and I think you actually could point this out from your own experience, that even if you don't spend your entire career in public service, even if you move in and out, um, that public service brings tremendous opportunities for young lawyers uh, to have great responsibility at an early age and great opportunity to really uh, not only make a difference, but learn really, really great skills themselves. So I would encourage any young person who wants to go into the field of environment to strongly consider both a career in environmental justice and even if you can't quite manage that one, spending some of your years, your formative years, dedicating your time to public service. What what a terrific uh, public encouragement and proclamation. And having spent 10 years at DOJ and reflecting on our time together at the Max and Irma's in Columbus, Ohio, when I might have been a little nervous before a certain trial, uh, I could not second your words more. And just thank you so much, Catherine, for providing us some of your time. I know it's scarce and uh, these times are particularly crazy. So thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time, Justin. It's a pleasure talking with you and with our audience. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.